All right, I want you to imagine with me that you're a cell in the brain. Let's say you're a member of the hypothalamus right here. And as a part of the hypothalamus, one of your jobs is to regulate how much fluid is in the blood volume at any given time. And so uh, you just got informed by another part of the brain that your buddy cell down in the kidneys right here has been making urine like a madman all day. And now the fluid volume in the blood is a little bit low. And so you want to tell him to stop. But how do you go about doing that? I mean, one way the body communicates is through the nervous system and sending messages down the hardwired, prelaid tracks of the nervous system through nerves, but there isn't really an established connection between you and him. And so what you decide to do is you, you decide to put a message in a bottle of sorts and float it down the bloodstream to him and hope that it gets there. And, and, and so you send that message his way, and he receives it. And he opens that message, and he sees that you want him to close the permeability to water and he does that and fluid volume begins to be restored again and so uh, that process of sending a message from one part of the body to another part of the body through the bloodstream forms the basis of the endocrine system the endocrine system and the endocrine system is a system of uh, glands that produce chemical messages called hormones that travel from one part of the body to another part of the body through the blood in order to elicit an effect, in order to make a change in what's going on in a different part of the body. And the effects that are caused by the endocrine system uh, cooperate with the nervous system in order to control the body's internal environment and homeostasis. And so the endocrine system and the nervous system are really related. They're almost like cousins. They're, they're really similar, but they, they're, they're kind of unique. The nervous system is kind of like the hair in the children's story uh, with the, the tortoise and the hair, and the endocrine system would be the, the tortoise. And so the, the nervous system is really, really fast, and you, you see results in milliseconds. And the endocrine system, in comparison, is fairly slow, and it, it might take minutes to even, even days or weeks to see the effects of these hormones. But like the children's story with the, with the tortoise and with the hair, the, the tortoise as fast as he goes, he kind of runs out of steam pretty quickly. And the endocrine system, as it goes a little bit slower, it's able to last longer. And so the effects, while slower, have a, a more lasting effect in the body with the endocrine system. And so anyway, the, the chemical messages called hormones that the endocrine system utilizes, they can be broken down into three distinct classes. First, you have proteins and polypeptides. And proteins and polypeptide hormones, like any other proteins in the body, are made up of amino acids, and they can be uh, really small, uh, as small as three or so amino acids, which is pretty tiny when you think about it, because an amino acid is, is a fairly small collection of atoms, and if you're talking about three amino acids, that's only a few atoms, all the way up to hundreds and hundreds of amino acids in a, um, in a polypeptide chain. And so typically, after you get about 100 amino acids in a chain, you start calling it a protein. And, and that holds true for hormones as well. And so the second class after proteins and polypeptides are steroid hormones. And unlike proteins and polypeptides that are made up of amino acids, steroid hormones are typically derived from cholesterol, which is a lipid. So from cholesterol. And so steroids are made up of, of lipids and have lipid-like qualities, like they're not charged and they can pass through cell membranes. And so that might mean the, the receptor, instead of being on the outside of the cell, is on the inside of the cell. And so you've got proteins and you've got steroids, and then you've got a class called tyrosine derivatives. And tyrosine is an amino acid. And this class of hormones, the reason it's separate is that they're, they're derived from tyrosine. Tyrosine can be manipulated in order to make... Uh, a couple different hormones. Okay, so the two main classes of tyrosine derivatives are thyroid hormones and catecholamines. Catecholamines, I hope I spelled that right. Catecholamines, and so catecholamines are the hormones that are made in the adrenal medulla, and they uh, include epinephrine and norepinephrine. And a little bit more common name outside of the medical community for epinephrine is adrenaline. And adrenaline is a little bit more familiar uh, because we hear it, when, you know, when you're really excited in your fight or flight response. And so these are the three main classes of hormones. And we see that they're classified by structure, but they're also classified by function in a separate system. And so e even though all these hormones are functioning in the endocrine system, not all of them have endocrine function. They're, uh, 
there's a class of hormones that are considered to have autocrine function. And these are hormones that, f- that elicit a response at the cell that they're made or in the, the cell immediately next to the cell that makes the hormone. And then there, in addition to autocrine signaling, there's paracrine signals. And this is, this is kind of more the, the regional effect. Uh, one example of paracrine signals are, are between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, those are really close. And so, uh, and so yeah, this is, there's not a, a hard line that gets drawn with where paracrine signal uh, function ends, but generally these are regionally acting signals. And then the last class are the endocrine signals. And those are the classic hormones that are said to function at a distance in the body. And, and their response is elicited somewhere far away. Let's say the pituitary gland traveling all the way down to the gonads. That's a pretty long distance in terms of hormone size and blood vessel length. And so those are called endocrine glands. And so now that we've, we've kind of covered how hormones are classified, I want to talk about the main organs of the endocrine system that use these hormones to communicate. And so I went ahead and, and pre-wrote out to save a little bit of time. And so the first organ that I want to talk about in the endocrine system is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is a member of the endocrine system, but it's also a member of the nervous system. It's right here in the brain. And it's about the size of a grape. And as a member of the nervous system, it's taking in uh, the the signals that are being uh, stimulated by the sensory nerves. And it takes those signals and it kind of funnels them into the endocrine system through the pituitary gland by controlling the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is often known as the master gland. And it's situated right here below the hypothalamus. And if the hypothalamus is about the size of a grape in the body, the the pituitary gland is about the size of a green pea. And it's tiny, but its role is huge in that it is it is principally involved in stimulating the, uh, the other endocrine glands, which are ultimately going to cause any of the effects that are happening in the body. And so the first uh, organ that it stimulates going down the list here is the thyroid gland and it stimulates the thyroid gland through thyroid stimulating hormone. And the thyroid gland is a gland that, that wraps around the trachea which is your windpipe and you can feel it when you sm- swallow but the thyroid gland's main role is regulating our body's metabolism. So kind of up regulating or down regulating the entire body and it does that through the thyroid hormones uh, T3 and, and T4. Another name for T3 is triiodothyronine, and another name for T4 is thyroxine, but those are the, those are the thyroid hormones that are a member of the tyrosine derivatives that I was talking about a little bit earlier. And so behind the thyroid gland are four spots that are kind of collectively known as the parathyroid gland. And I'm drawing them on the front, but I want to be clear that these spots are on the back of the, of the thyroid gland. And the parathyroid gland is principally or, or kind of chiefly involved in regulating our body's calcium levels. And it does that through its hormone, parathyroid hormone. And so moving down the list, we have the adrenal glands right here on top of the kidneys. And they're called adrenal glands because they're adjacent to the kidneys. And another name for the kidneys are the and the, the whole kidney system is the, the renal system. And the adrenal glands are stimulated by the pituitary's release of adrenocorticotropic hormone. And then they ultimately release their hormones. And there are, there are two kind of separate areas of the adrenal glands. You've got the cortex of the adrenal glands, which is the outside, and the medulla, which is the, the inside of the adrenal glands. But the cortex is where the adrenal steroid hormones Come from, and so you've got your glucocorticosteroids and your uh, mineralocorticosteroids, and those are things like cortisol and aldosterone, and those have a, a lot of functions in the body as far as regulating uh, fluid volume and the the stress response. And in the metal, the medulla, that's where the catecholamine hormones are made. And uh, again, those catecholamines were the second class of tyrosine derivatives that I mentioned earlier. So moving, moving down the list even further, we have the gonads. In females, those are your ovaries. And in males, your testes. And the gonads are stimulated by the pituitary's release of uh, FSH and LH, which is follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And the gonads then take that stimulation and release their, their hormones, the sex hormones. 
And so in, in ladies, that, that's mostly progesterone and estrogen, and in males, testosterone. And those are your, those are your gonads. And then kind of outside of that pituitary signaling system is the pancreas right here. The pancreas isn't, isn't stimulated by the pituitary gland directly, but it does release some pretty important hormones, insulin and glucagon, which function to regulate the blood sugar level. And again, the blood sugar level is pretty tied into metabolism as glucose is kind of the backbone molecule that we get all of our energy from.